mission. Should you choose to accept it. It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. Well, The Rock says, why don't we just cut right to the chase? Okay, now he, uh, you know, he wants to get together. Well, you know, he wants to talk. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. It's showtime, folks! What are you? I'm... Greetings and salutations. Welcome to And I Quote, the weekly show where we're bringing content creators of all shapes and sizes joining us from any and all corners of the nerd universe. We find out more about them and what plans they have for the future. I am your host, Ryan of Nerd Culture. Thank you for being with us. And our guest this week is horror slash fantasy, comic writer and artist, and also one of the co-hosts of Comic Book Spectrum. Please welcome Brian Robin. Brian, welcome to the program. How are you today? I'm doing great, man. I'm a uh... Doing fantastic. Got my coffee representing my uh, my fellow's mugs on my mug. And uh, I'm happy to be here, buddy. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're very happy that you are with us. If you have any questions for our guest, Brian Robin, during any portion of this program, please feel free to leave them in the live chat. Leave them in the comment section below. Our producer is going to be monitoring it as we go throughout the course of the show. We will get to them as they come in. So, Brian, to uh, kick things off, I should say, how are you introduced to the world of comics? Oh gosh. Um I actually uh Batman Michael Keaton's Batman movie. That was the introduction to superheroes for me. Uh cuz it came out it came out in 1989. I was 3 years old. Um and it my earliest memory is watching it at home right when it came out on VHS. A brief moment. I'm sitting on the couch with um my mom and my sister there's a blank i remember the blanket across us and i'm looking at the screen as the joker hand comes out of the acid from that point on i was hooked um and i uh from that movie i found the death of superman and between that the ninja turtles and the archie ninja turtle comics mm-hmm. um i was uh, i was absolutely and utterly hooked never to be saved again from comic books <laughs> Well, Brian, you are my number <laughs> one guy. I mean, seriously, just like you, man. That was one of the first films I remember watching on VHS. You got the Diet Coke commercial coming in with Alfred saying, the Gotham Corner Store, we seen you yeah. the last day. Good. A gentleman is on his way to pick some up. Just look for a black car. No, this oh, black car will be rather difficult to miss. <laughs> so... That's beautiful. I love that. That's look, man. Just like you, that was one of my first introductions to superheroes and comic book comic book heroes. I should say, mm-hmm. one of the best films ever made. Period. Yeah. I don't care if you people say, "Oh, you're letting your nostalgia glasses cloud your judgment." No, 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 no. No. If we love the movie, and I still watch it on VHS. By the way, I have it on VHS and Blu-ray, so I have multiple formats to watch this gorgeous film on. I will watch it, and I will still enjoy it as I did when I was a little wee lad. So, <laughs> if you like it, support it, and if you don't like it, there's the door. Don't let it hit you on the way out. No, it's fine. If you don't like a movie, it's fine. Hey, we're all friends here. We're all family. Don't worry about it. But that's a great, great pick, man. That's that's yeah. fantastic. So what, what would you say were some of your favorite comic book writers or artists growing up, or maybe even today? Um, A lot of them have remained the same. Uh, growing up, I, uh, I loved, let's see, I mean, I loved Peter Laird, obviously. Uh, he worked on the the Archie comics, um, and um, and really the Ty Templeton because I loved Batman the Animated Series so much. Ty Ty Templeton drew all of the comic books for the Batman Animated Series, so he was probably the one I was first fascinated with the most. I tried to replicate the most um, as a child. And then as I grew into teenage years, Frank Miller became a huge influence of uh, my my love of comics, specifically his run on Daredevil, um, which to this day still holds up. Um, You know, unfortunately, a lot of new Frank Miller stuff is a little sketchy, but his classics, you can't deny. The man was uh, absolutely brilliant with his Daredevil run, The Dark Knight uh, Returns and Batman Year One that you can never take that away from him and then you've got of course the brilliant and artistically gorgeous sin city 
um, and 300 as well. Both were just fantastic. Um, Frank Miller really got me from, he, he was the one that really pulled me from, um, the movie TV show influence of comics mm -hmm. into just comic books themselves. Um, I see. so he, so I always kind of teetered that edge between animation movies and comic books. They all kind of fell in the same realm of, uh, of, you know, my love affair with, with story and then Frank Miller just really pulled me in into just the comic books. And um, and then from that point on, comics were always my favorite, um, you know, entertainment media of, of choice. And um, yeah, but it, it, and then after that, probably the most significant creator uh, in my life is Mike Mignola. Um, so comic book creator uh it's definitely mike mignola I, I was introduced to hellboy as a teenager um with the movie uh the movie came first for me and i knew it was a comic when the movie came out but i had just never really gotten into it never really read it love the movies love both of them they were great well the, the new one I, I enjoy the new one for different reasons but uh <laughs> the 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 first two were fantastic with ron perlman but uh, hands down, I prefer the comic. The comic, the, the universe of Hellboy that Mike Mignola, what Mike Mignola showed me with Hellboy and the BPRD and, and all the other spinoffs is what you can actually do in comics, uh, where you can have a run of a character that everyone enjoys and then subtly start introducing side characters. And, and in, when those side characters are introduced, you tell their stories separately and you, and then they all come back into one overarching climactic story that everyone is experiencing from their perspective and point of view. And it's all done by one person's imagination who teams and collaborates with other people. But up until that point in comics that had never really been done with one person at the helm. Um, obviously DC and Marvel have, you know, always had, you know, the events, uh, you know, where, where multiple characters and their, their books have, have tied in with each other, but, but that was a, a multitude of collaborators never had it been done where it was just one man's vision, uh, spearheading everything. Of course, you know, like I said, he, he had collaborators, but Mike Mignola really, really, like I said, he showed me what you can do with the comic book medium in ways that I had never seen before. Um, and I fell in love. I still do. I, I, anything he puts out, I try to grab it, my, my hands on it as soon as I possibly can. Uh, he's an absolute genius when it comes to creating. Um, and as a man, as a person, I've watched many interviews with him. Unfortunately, I've not met him yet. I'd love to. That, that's on my bucket list. But he's, he's such a humble guy. It's just like a normal dude, but inside that brain is multiple worlds of, of, of chaotic fun genius. And, uh, and I would say, uh, you know, other than, other than Mike Mignola and Frank Miller, Neil Gaiman is also at the top of that list. Um, Neil Gaiman Sandman is, uh, my second favorite comic run of all time. Uh, the first being Mike Mignola's Hellboy. And, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, Neil Gaiman, I, I think I've taken his course in masterclass like four or five times now <laughs> because he just, the way he creates is so, I can relate to it so much. Like just, it's how my brain works as well. And when you find a creator that you, you really, you know, understand the weird little quirks that they say when they're creating and be like, wait, mm -hmm. I do that too. When you find that grab a hold of it and, and listen to everything that person says, because I have, I have gleaned so much from, uh, from different, um, you know, books that Neil Gaiman has written, but also, uh, the technique that he explains in different interviews and his masterclass and, and, um, just, you know, essentially reading his stuff is a learning experience every single time. Well, that is truly amazing. And if you feel like expanding on this, feel free, because this kind of this leads into my next question. What would you say are some of your favorite comic book movies or TV series, even though you've already dropped a handful of titles in our laps just now? But if there are there any that you wish to uh, mention up to this point, any more favorite comic book movies or TV series past or present? 
Um, I would say I can't ever talk about Batman the Animated Series enough. Um, that is probably the biggest influence of my art style. Um, it's the biggest influence of storytelling for me. I, I was fascinated by it as a kid. And it, it, it really made me fall in love with Batman uh, so much. Um, and... And, and and then as I got older and really wanted to dive into, you know, how to make comics, what comics looked like, I, I really just wanted my comics to look like that show, or at least the first couple seasons of that show, that, that mm-hmm. original, really dark, you know, beautifully, um, you know, drawn uh, and painted world of Gotham City that is in the first two seasons of Batman, the animated series. What Bruce Timm did... Uh, with that show is, uh, you know, he he took what Don Bluth did so well because he he worked with Don Bluth. Oh. Um, you know, he he took what Don Bluth did so well in the the late eighties with animation and put it into a TV show. And um, and I mean, you look at Bruce Timm's career now; the man's in charge of Warner Brother Animation, uh, and and for for good reason. I mean, he did he did a a spectacular job spearheading everything and really um you know just just giving giving animation the dual level storytelling that you know every kid would enjoy and every adult would enjoy and i i I mean i have the collector's box of of (laughs) batman the animated series with the little bitty pops and and everything you know i i have all that (laughs) stuff uh because that show means so much to me and it has influenced my storytelling and my art so, so much in, in ways that I don't even understand. So uh, if I have to go off on a tangent about a, a movie or TV show uh, that has to do with you know comics, that will always be it. Because it did so, mm-hmm. so much for me as a, as a creator. I'm surprised you didn't drop some love in there for that little indie film that has got a huge following on home video after its short theatrical run, Mask of the Phantasm. <laughs> right yeah oh gosh i mean i saw mask of the phantasm in theaters and oh um, you were one of the lucky few then because it was, was only in theaters for like one or two weeks and then it was yeah gone yeah never to be heard was, or seen from again it was uh I, I was able to see it in theaters and it i i vaguely remember it but not really it's probably just my imagination filling in the blanks mm. but uh i mean i can't tell you how many times i've seen that movie that is actually that is my favorite batman movie of all time all time um, Yes, uh, because I feel like, first of all, Kevin Conroy will always be Batman to me. He's a beast. He's yeah, a beast. I, I mean, when I read yeah. the comics, that's whose voice I hear. Mark Hamill will always be the Joker Oof. for me. Yeah. Um, and, and and it was literally the, the storytelling in that, uh, I mean, it, as good as it was in the series, it just amped up to, to level 11 um with with that movie and and you know the twist at the end with who the phantasm was it was an mm-hmm. original villain um you know they did such a good job i don't think in the batman universe i don't think there had been a good uh, as good a villain as the phantasm until court of owls i think from those two points you really got the introduction to like a really amazing and creative original take on um on something new that batman had never faced before and in mask of the phantasm you finally got to see the origin story of batman that they hadn't done yet um which i also think was a brilliant move to just you know throw it out there where you they didn't you know they started with uh you know it depends on what order you go on it's either the man bad episode or the red claw episode um, you know, they, they, you just jump right into the action. Batman's already established. Robin's in college. You know, like it's all, it's, yeah, it's everybody's already, all already, together. He's been playing the game a while. He's been doing yeah. his, his thing, delivering justice the only way he knows how. And, and, you know, but yeah, no, Mask of the Phantasm is definitely one of the better origin stories I've ever seen yeah. in a comic book film. And also the love interest, you know, mm-hmm. uh, what was her name? Anne. Andrea. Andy, Andrea. <laughs> yes, Andrea Beaumont. Now well there was a sweet number. How'd you let her get this? <laughs> Thanks well for the done, handkerchief, sir. Arthur. You know where you can stick it. <laughs> I mean, my gosh, that love interest. And by the way, Dana Delaney is no slouch. That woman's been acting and voice oh, acting gosh. for decades upon decades. And the fact that she can play one character in the Batman universe and then go on to play Lois Lane in yeah. the Superman universe, I'm thinking, okay, this woman has a lot of range. A lot yeah. of range as an actress. I'm like, dang. 
Yeah. It's sweet she, stuff. And just out of curiosity, did you buy because they re-released this on Blu-ray a couple of years back? I'm not sure if mm-hmm. you knew this or not. Did you get Mask of the Phantasm when it was remastered on Blu-ray? It's in my collector's box. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> I was gonna say, like, if you have the series, you have to at least have yeah. Mask of the Phantasm. It actually that uh yeah. that collector's box came with uh oh, here came with the movie. It came with the movie, but it also came with uh, uh the Mr. Freeze movie, if you remember. Oh, that. the Sub Zero? Yeah, it came with like, Sub Zero. Yeah, I, you as well. know, I like Sub Zero. Oh, I love it too. What's interesting fact? Here it is. Oh, ooh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've seen three. that. I think I've seen that yeah. in Best Buy at one point. If not, it's on yeah. Amazon, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely available everywhere. That's but um, but yeah. The interesting fact about uh, Sub Zero: it was originally the script for Batman and Robin, and they scrapped it to make it more kid friendly. And then they uh, ended up using the script for a children's movie. I don't understand it. What? <laughs> uh, I was going to say, what the frack were the executives thinking? Because that would have been a much better movie than we got in 97's Batman and Robin. I'm sorry. I will say this, though. In defense of Batman and Robin, George Clooney is an excellent successor to Adam West. Unfortunately, that is not the continuity. Because we, <laughs> you can't be Adam West's Batman in the same continuity as Michael Keaton's Batman. That no, that just can't. doesn't really work. But if you just watch Batman and Robin, as it you know, without the others before it, mm-hmm. just as a tongue-in-cheek, campy movie in the spirit of the Batman '66 show, it is actually wonderful. <laughs> you can see Arnold Schwarzenegger having the time of his life playing Mister Freeze. And and never ever ever play a drinking game with how many times he makes ice puns because you will die by the yeah. end of the movie before the mm-hmm. end of the movie. I know because we tried it once and my friend passed out in the first twenty five minutes. Twenty five so, minutes of the film. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot of them. <laughs> so what killed the dinosaurs? The ice, the ice age. age. <laughs> oh god! In this universe, there's only one absolute. Everything freezes. I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> whoever wrote this was pretty silly and stupid. But I will say yeah. this though, the the thing about the ice puns is that one. There's one scene where he doesn't make an ice pun. He's watching the video of his wedding between him and his wife. And mm. the guy comes in to give him the newspaper about the jewels being sold at the yeah. auction, whatever it is. I hate when people talk to him in the movie. Yeah. I'm like, yes, yeah. finally someone tells the audience that when you are watching a film in a theater full of 350 plus people, yeah. shut your trap unless it's a big, uh, what do you call it? One of those fist pump moments like in an Avengers movie. Oh, yeah. Then yeah, you yeah, can lose sure. your mind. If something happens in an Avengers MCU Star Wars film, then you can lose your mind. Anything else? Yeah. Just zip it. Yep. What was that? Pretty much. Zip it. Zip it good. You know. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yeah, Mask of the Phantasm is great. Sub Zero, I think, is criminally underrated. That is such oh, a great tragic like backstory for Freeze that we never get. We clearly never got in the night. Well, we got hints of it in '97, but it never really happened. Mm. But because yeah, that, yeah, like, good Heart lord, of, Heart of Ice. Um, you know, well, the introduction familiar? was that was what? that a, was that that was an episode of the series. That was the episode. That was the episode where Mister Freeze is introduced into the series. Oh, I think yeah, it was like yeah, yeah. episode. Three or four. I can't. I haven't remember. seen that in a while. I got to go back and rewatch that. But that was a good oh, episode too. I right? still cry. I still. Paul Dini. It's Paul Dini's work at his best. Uh, the man just. I mean, and I was listening to uh, Fat Man on Batman, Kevin Smith's podcast about sure. Batman, way before Mark Bernardin showed up. Way mm. before it's the show it is now. When it was literally sure. just, it was an audio. It was just a podcast, just audio. And it was Kevin Smith sitting across the table from somebody, usually smoking weed, and, um, oh and talking about Batman. And he had, in the first, like, 10 or 12 episodes, he had all of the Batman animated series actors on there, including Kevin Conroy, Mark oh, Hamill, hello. all the guys. Unfortunately, the show's in archive now. Those episodes, you can't find them, and I've tried. If anybody can find them, Let send them to me, because I, I miss them. But uh, he was talking to Paul Dini about that episode. And Paul Dini is describing why Mr. Freeze does what he does and, you know, like what inspired him to write that episode. And the man just starts crying, talking about it. So you just like, you know how much, you know how much um, Dini cares about this show and about, you know, these characters because he's pouring his soul into it. And you can totally tell it's still today. The uh, the end of the episode, you know, where 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 Freeze is in Arkham, and he's holding the uh, <clears throat> he's holding the 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 little ice sculpture 
of uh you know of his wife oh and, yeah it's like a uh, snow globe yeah yeah it's like a snow globe kind of thing and 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 he you know it's just so sad. It's so somber and, and, and it's so real. It's raw, raw emotion. in a children's cartoon is rarely seen and they did it so well. And I, I, I at least cry up or cry up. I at least tear up every time. <laughs> um, uh, if I don't just full on, uh, you know, ugly cry at that. Ugly episode. cry. Wow. Because that's something nice. That's something else. That's something else. <laughs> but yeah, I got to go back and rewatch that because it's been a hot minute. Well, no puns intended. Hot minute since I've seen a freeze episode. See what I did there? Yeah. yeah. My check's in the mail, I'm sure. But <laughs> yeah, I got to go back and watch that. But but yeah, no, great films, great series. No question about it. You know, I, I still I still Mask of the Phantasm. I can enjoy to this day. That movie's mm. like, what, thir- almost 30 years young? And something doesn't like matter. that. Still yeah. one of the top, top quality written, produced, directed, whatever you want to call it films now when you fast forward past all that do you have batman beyond return of the joker in your collection as well <laughs> you don't do so you? no i i have i have the collector's blu-ray edition oh wow of, okay uh, i was gonna say i'm like man on. if you're a batman uh, fan you gotta have all three you gotta have sub-zero mask of the phantasm and return of the joker you gotta have all three. so i also have this guy uh the batman beyond oh yes came with the figure or no the pop yep. excuse me the yes. pop yeah it's still in there oh it's uh, still in there it's okay. a brilliant show uh I, I love batman beyond so much and um yeah the return of the joker is i, I was surprised at how good it was and if you if you really love the movie you should check out the director's cut because it's pg-13 instead of pg and uh it is there's a lot of blood in it uh and the 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 death of the joker is different in that version he uh robin just straight up he straight up shoots him uh in that version instead of him being electrocuted so it is is. yeah it's a really cool uh it's a it's a very very cool version of the movie that um I, i i love it i have that and the traditional one and uh i think i actually think in the blu-ray collector's edition they have just both on the same disc nerd so, yeah. no we appreciate yes. it <laughs> so, have, 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 i mean before i move on to the next thing here i'm just curious have you had the pleasure of meeting any of the iterations of batman such as kevin conroy will friedel anybody like that oh because lord like knows I mean. i've had my fair share of actors from the batman universe yeah i feel like i uh this is show and tell a little bit, but um, so... hey, it's okay. We still got plenty of time for more <laughs> questions. And if you do have a question for Brian Robin, let us know in the comments, leave them in the chat. We will be taking them as we progress within the show itself. So what do you have for yeah. show and tell this week? So Brian? indeed. Uh, so this is the, at, at the moment, the best um, comic con moment I've ever had. Oh, I, okay. I rarely fangirl, but when I do, fangirl. it's when I meet Kevin Conroy and Ooh. have him sign my um my oh my good hold on a second i gotta i gotta do this for the for you the viewer at home hold on a second there it is there you go to brian what is can you read that off for us for those of us who can't read curses to brian i am vengeance i am the knight i am batman kevin conroy and this is actually a um out of print uh behind the scenes book about the animated series it Ooh. is uh if i ever find mark hamill i'll have him sign right here and uh and the same with bruce tim as well oh bruce tim yeah yeah but um but yeah this is one of my prized possessions kevin conroy was a a, a joy to talk to he was uh he was absolutely a a, a wonderful man very humble very kind um, very tired <laughs> when I <laughs> when I met him. We were both tired because we had both been there. It was a Saturday at Indiana uh, Comic Con in Indianapolis, sure. and uh, he had been signing and meeting people. My gosh, it had to have been three or four hours. And um, yeah, dude was just moving. Knocking and out. Um, and finally, it died down a little bit. And uh, I walked over and had him sign that and talk to him. We were both so tired, we barely said words. But, um, but he was a really kind man and, uh, it was, it was, it was a really cool fangirl moment. I got back to the table and like all the blood finally rushed back to the rest of my extremities. And I looked at my my wife and I was like, look at what just happened. (laughs) (laughs) 
So. Oh my goodness. Uh, what was your wife reaction when you showed that to her? Was she, oh, she honey, was I'm so happy for you. And then she's like, honey, sit back down. We have work to do. <laughs> no, well, we actually, she knows how much that means to me. And she was very excited for me in that moment. She was, uh, she was very, uh, she humored me quite a bit. She was, she was excited for me. Well, that is just awesome. Tacular. I had the pleasure of meeting Kevin Conroy myself and I went up to his booth. I was wearing a Batman shirt at the time. And I said, hey, listen, I did this last week, Kevin. I just want to let you know, I rewatched that little indie film called Mask of the Phantasm. And I got to tell you, it's so good. It's so good. I think it's great. And then he's like, really? It's my favorite, too. And I'm yeah. just like, Kevin's like playing it off. And when he got to his booth, because we were all sitting, we were all standing there. And he says, I am. He did the whole spiel. Yeah, I am yeah, yeah. And I'm like, dang, this guy at his age, after doing this for so many years, he hasn't lost his touch. I don't think Not he ever really will. And then he climbed back down. He signed for everybody. He shook everybody's hand. I showed him my uh, my shirt. He's. I said, I like the movies. I thank you so much. And then he signed an eight. I, I didn't have anything of my personal possession at that point for mm -hmm. him to sign. So he just signed an eight by ten from the animated series. Him. Yeah, I think it was yeah. him like on a on a on a batarang and it's, and he's like holding his hand out. Yeah. And it says, "True Ryan, I'm Batman." Yeah. But the funny thing about that was, sometime later, I went to another convention. I met Will Friedel, Terry McGinnis. And he signed a print that says, to Ryan, I'm Batman. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, Will, I like you. I like you a lot. But I did meet your counter, your predecessor at another convention. He signed his print the same. I was like, oh, don't worry about it. We do that all the time. If we're at conventions together, I'll sign mine. I'm Batman. And then he'll That's sign hilarious. his. No, I'm Batman. <laughs> so if Kevin and... Will are ever at a convention together? That's what's going to happen if you buy an eight by ten, or if you just oh, get something man. of your personal collection signed. They're going to say, "No, wait a minute, I'm Batman." Yeah, oh, they play off hilarious. each other really well. So if I ever get to see the two of them again at the same convention, Brian, that's going to be a trip, man. Oh, I'm, I just, bet. I'm just saying. But it was fun meeting the two of them. Don't get me wrong. Wow, we talked so much about the Dark Knight. I wonder what else we can talk about, Brian. What do you think? Yeah. Well, here's something for you. When did you specifically decide to become a comic book writer or artist? Well, um. It's kind of funny. I, 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 um, I always kind of, I wanted to be a comic creator, but the, uh, you know, the, the stars never really aligned. I never really knew how to do it. And honestly, when I was a teenager, uh, you know, growing, you know, growing up and trying to figure out what you want to do for a living, um, it was very difficult to break into the comic industry. Um, I mean, it's, it's somewhat difficult still, but it was extremely difficult then. Uh, because you know, all the things that we have now, the, 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 you know, digital printing for indie comics, um, you know, just Kickstarter, uh, Indiegogo, uh, none of that was around. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't really just think, dream of something and, 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 you know, produce it and then get it printed. It, it, that, unless you used, you know, unless you spent a lot of money at FedEx or Kinko's or something, it just wasn't going to happen. And, um, and even then, you know, it was just black and white Xerox. But, uh, so I, I went on and, and, and I really, you know, I was pursuing vocational ministry, um, for, uh, quite some time, uh, I ended up going to seminary, uh, for a few years. And during that time, I, I kept finding myself, um, you know, everything that I would learn, everything that I would, you know, take in, it, it, it just started sparking my imagination. And, and I still have some of my, you know, notes in my theology classes and stuff, you know, on the side there, I've got little comic book ideas, um, you know, which it all ended up becoming memoirs of an angel. Um, and, uh, and yeah, during that time, you know, that I ended up going into the medical field instead and uh, spent some time there and really got, you know, that during that time I met my, my, my wife, I met Robin and so a lot of that time was just dreaming things up, writing a lot of notes, writing a lot of scripts that never saw the light of day, um, doodling all the time, but never really taking it seriously. And then finally in 2015 or 2014, this was, uh, I had been telling Robin about memoirs of an angel, little bits and pieces here and there. Mm -hmm. Finally, she sat me down and she's like, baby, I love you. If you don't do this, uh, you either need to make this happen or stop talking about it because I'm going to kill you unless you do this, you know, and, and because I, in, in her defense, I would, I would just tell her random scenes with zero context to, to me. It made sense somewhat, but to her it made no sense whatsoever. Hmm. And um, so, you know, my wife's an accountant, a very accomplished businesswoman. 
and she said um okay. she said well she's like you know i'll help you i'll help you because i had no idea how to make this a reality and i had mm-hmm. I had done a little short story with uh, Rebel Rouser Comics. It's a, it was an indie uh, local uh, publisher, um, and uh, I did that in 2012. And I kind of got that, you know, I, I thought that was my 15 seconds of fame, and that would have been it. And and it was really, it was not good. I did not put a good, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And and it shows. There's only one copy of that in existence uh, that I own, and or I don't own it. My parents do. And, um, and it was not very good. And, and I figured that was it for me. And then in 2014, my wife and I had that talk and I went to, um, a local comic con here in Louisville Hmm. and, uh, sat in on a panel about creating comics and what to do. If you, you know, are at step zero, where where do you go from here? You have an idea. You, 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 where do you, what do you do? Where do you go? And I, I sat in that panel. I took notes. I actually sat in on the same panel the next day and then went to the creator um, who was leading the panel uh, after his second panel and just said, hey, I really want to do this. I loved your show. You know, I loved what your panel was. And uh, and he kind of took me under his wing a little bit and, uh, you know, really helped me, you know, encouraged me and, and showed me the, the basic ropes Um of, of how things worked in the year 2015 at this time. And that's from that point on, I, 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 I started and I haven't looked back um, because the, the timing was right. The, the, the tools are, were there. I was able to do digital printing. I had Kickstarter. I had, um, you know, social media uh, to, to, to really help build a fan base and um, all those things with, you know, uh, consistency, talent, and time you, you, you can, you can accomplish this stuff with that. And that, that's 2015. That's I, I literally, I was like, okay, I have all these ideas. I have, uh, uh, you know, people in my corner and let's go do this thing. And so from that point on, I, I was a comic book creator. My goodness gracious. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Now there is a, now you had, you take a coin, there are two sides to the coin here. So what would you say are some of the rewards of being a comic book writer or artist? Um, I would say that, well, obviously the rewards, um, (laughs) for me is that, first of all, it's the finished product. You know, you, you hold that, uh, you hold that book in your hands and, um, there's nothing quite like that to, to, to know that something started in your head and, and now you're holding it and it's something that you can show other people and, 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 and enjoy with, uh, you know, other people with, and, um, that, that's, that's a huge thing, but also just the fact that when you're a creator, when you're a writer or an artist, you know, e- either one, um, you have this world in your head and it's almost like, um, it, it just, it just continues to build and grow and build this pressure in you. And when you get it out, there's this release, there's a, a weight that's lifted off of you and, and, and off of your imagination and it's it's just so much fun (laughs) it's a fun process and and you know that's why a lot of people you know they 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 say oh gosh like it's you know it's work and it is work it is absolute work to do this but i can tell you with the utmost honesty that there is never a day where i sit down at at the computer or the drawing tablet um and i don't want to be there um because you know if if I weren't putting comic books out, I would still be dreaming all this stuff up. So I might as well, you know, be actually creating it uh, because it's what I'd be doing anyway. So I would say that the most rewarding thing is uh, is is a tie between the just the actual creation process itself mm-hmm. and 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 the finished product of holding it in your hand and uh, the sugar coated topping of all of it for me. Is sharing it with the people that I care about hearing people enjoy the stories that I create is just so much fun because ultimately at the end of the day as a creator, if you're not creating for yourself, then you're going to hate it because you know, and, and it sounds selfish, but it, it originates. Like I said, it's, it's, it's this whole world that's building in your brain and in your imagination. And if you aren't getting the, the satisfaction and the joy of the creative process. If you aren't enjoying that, then, then, then you're more than likely not going to last very long. 
um, especially people, people as a, in general, the, the general, you know, population is very fickle. Sometimes you'll, you'll be on top of the world and the next minute, you, you know, nobody, nobody wants to, to know what you're doing. And, and or you look, look at the life of Edgar Allan Poe. Nobody gave a crap about what he wrote for the most part until he was dead. <laughs> you know, so it's, <laughs> and, it's, uh, and, huh. And the ironic thing is, there's a number of festivals and events that are being held every year during spooky season. Speaking of October, Edgar Allan Poe yeah. Festival here in my neck of the woods, here in Maryland, you know, here in Baltimore, where he, you know, he kind of died. Yeah. You know, we have we have the cemetery. We have this, there's this event coming up called a Toast Among Ghosts being held at the newly renovated Ricerstown Library here in Ricerstown, Maryland. And they're doing this festival where they bring in people who dress up. They have a Edgar Allan Poe impersonator who's in the graveyard reciting Edgar Allan Poe's works that you can yeah. see and meet with. And then you got people in the graveyard that are talking about the, their ghosts and their spirits and all that stuff. So I went there before the world kind of ended a right. few years ago, and it was fun. I had a good time. I had some friends of mine I think were, were there, and I went on the go. I went on the tour throughout the cemetery and all that stuff. So if you are interested in any of that sort of stuff, to, not to go on a local plug here. But oh, check out, well, be, just go to bcpl.info if you're in the Maryland area. That's all I'm going to say about that. But Brian, we're talking about we're, we're talking with comic book writer and artist extraordinaire Brian Robin. If you have any questions for him, drop them in the comments, drop them in the live chat. We're going to be getting to him as we go along. Also, make sure you're sharing this video with 300 of your best friends. They're going to like the way they look after watching these videos. I guarantee it. So, Brian, on the flip side of things, what are some of the challenges of being a comic book writer or artist? Um, it's it's the uh the grind at the same time, which is interesting from what I just said, uh, because at the end of the day, like I said, it is work. Uh, so when you're feeling ill or when you're feeling like you just rather, you know, lay there and do nothing. Um, sometimes there's a place, well, actually there is absolutely a place for that. I think rest is a huge part of the creative process as, as creators. If you're not, if you're not resting and consuming something that, that really inspires you to create, then you're missing a huge part of the creative process. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of creators, and understandably so, um, take a huge pride on, uh, you know, they 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 take a, they take huge pride in in not stopping, right? Just continuing to work and continuing to, to grind and plug it out. And there's th that's commendable. The spirit of that is commendable. But first of all, it's it's not um, helpful to the creative process. Uh, making making a schedule and scheduling time to rest and, and consume things are, uh, that is, that is a huge part of, uh, of being inspired enough to then go and create your own thing. And I had to learn that the hard way. So that is probably the, the making time for rest is the hardest part because if you're like me and you're resting, you feel guilty because you don't, you feel like you could be doing something productive, but in reality, you are doing something productive and it's just as a, uh, resting and, 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 um, you know, and, and just sitting there watching a movie, reading a book, um, you know, reading a comic, doing what we're doing now, just sitting and talking about, it, uh, about our favorite thing, our favorite Batman shows and movies. <laughs> All of that is just as important and just as needed as sitting at the drawing table and working. Um, because if, if you don't have that side, if you don't have the rest with the work, you're going to burn out. You're going to get tired of what you're doing. Um, uh, and it's going to show in your work. It, it, you know, you are going to, uh, not put out your best stuff. If you're, if you're dog tired and refusing rest for your body and your soul. Um, and, uh, you know, your imagination, there's something very spiritual about the creative process. There's something very um, unscientific, if you will, about what inspires you as a creator. And, um, and, and you have to nourish that. You have to nourish your soul. You have to nourish your imagination. And that comes through rest. It comes through uh, consuming other things that you enjoy. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it involves just checking out you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, meditating or praying and, um, you know, you have to recharge those batteries just as you have to recharge your physical batteries and both your physical and your spiritual, mental, emotional needs have to be met for you to then go and create something that's going to help someone else do the same. 
could not have said it better myself. I think one of the key words here to take away from this is rest is crucial. Yes. If you don't get a right amount of rest, if you, you know, the average Joe needs to get between eight or nine hours of sleep a night. If I'm not getting between nine or 10, yeah. my mind's going to be mush. Like for instance, if I didn't get the amount of sleep that I got the night before, I, I, I don't know where I would be. <laughs> My good. I mean, honestly, I needed that recharge. And I think you who are watching this at home, you, we all need rest. I mean, we live in a crazy, crazy world right now. So the best yes. thing we can do for ourselves is take a breath, get some rest, read a good book. Why don't you? Because mm, to me, yeah. at least in my opinion, maybe you at home may think differently, but in my opinion, life is better when reading. Yeah. I feel, I'm and not then, sure how anyone else <laughs> feels, but that's because I can't speak for everybody. That's not my job, but yeah, let, rest is crucial. So pretty much everything that <laughs> Brian just said, I'm trying to echo it in the best paraphrased way. <laughs> But I know I'm not doing a very good job of it, but Brian, any, you kind of mentioned this a little bit while, a little while ago, but if you want to expand on this one, I'm just curious, any other mm -hmm. special memories from being at conventions or other events, whether you were there as a vendor or as an attendee? Um, I think honestly, the, a lot of them run together. We have been, my, you know, my wife and I have been through quite a bit of shows already in the last six years. Um, but I, I think one always remains the same. And, and that is, uh, it sounds cheesy maybe, but it, it is true, is seeing our, our con family, as we call them. Uh, the people that you don't normally see other than in this type of situation, but in person, uh, there's something wonderful about seeing uh, people in person, especially especially people that you've only met and seen online in, in, in forums like this. Um, to finally meet, the I remember the, the, the epic moment where me and uh, Brian K. Morris drink um <laughs> when me and brian k morris met at uh, imaginarium this year um i have unfortunately i have yet to actually meet my cohort the rest of my cohorts at comic book spectrum uh clyde and eric in person but um it was it was wonderful the weekend was made just because i was able to hang out with him and cookie um and uh and I, that is what that is what I miss the most about not going to comic cons in the last couple mm -hmm. years. And that is yeah. uh, the thing I look forward to all the time. And those are the cherished memories. Uh, I know, you know, like I, I said before the show, I was able to, to hang out with uh, Mike and Ming from comic book men mm -hmm. uh, one time for just, it was a slow show and they were finished with a panel and we hung out for like an hour. We took goofy pictures and talked about comics and movies and cause there was nothing else to do at the moment. And, and, you know, those are the times to me that are the most special. Uh, when you can create a new relationship, you can interact with people that you don't normally get to see and talk to um, and, uh, and, and share some fun moments and make some memories. That is, is uh, what, for me, other than being there and selling the book and, you know, getting the book in other people's hands. And other than that, that is, you know, the, those moments are the best uh, reason to go to Comic-Cons for me. There you go. Bromance. Indeed. Between, between the two Bryans. <laughs> two Bryans don't make it right. Ha ha ha. Ha ha. Never. Never would no, we. <laughs> they never, no, they never do. They never do. They, ne they, oh, gee willikers. They never do. So outside of creating the next great comic book that's going to blow everyone's minds, do you have any hobbies that you've taken up either before or during the, the uh, recent events of the pandemic? Poetry. Um, I, I have really... Uh, did you know we're in a pandemic folks? <laughs> um, and it's still and, going on. Yay. No, I, I have, uh, in the last, and I don't mind talking about this uh, in, in the last year, I have really, uh, um, been aware of uh, a growing depression in me and many people ha are experiencing the same thing. We're in a really rough time right now, mm -hmm. uh, with, mm -hmm. with COVID and, you know, uh, different, you know, different reactions to that and, Isolation. and, um, yeah, uh, isolation, all the ripple effects of a pandemic. Um, and in that time, I have really drank deeply from the well of poetry, if you will. Um, it, it's it's it has become you know writing poetry just for me, not not for you know not for anybody else to consume. Just in in my time, you know, journaling, I pray through poetry. Um, uh, I, uh, you know, I use it, you know, yeah, I, I use it to, uh, to really recharge my, my, all the batteries that, that I need to recharge. Um, 
you know, I have found great solace in poetry uh, in the last six months, especially, and um, mostly consuming writing it every now and then. But um, but I guess you could call it a hobby. I, I, I don't really, uh, other than that, the, the rest of my hobby is creating comics. So that's mostly what I do with my time. Other, if I'm not reading um, or, or watching a movie or, or, you know, hanging out with my wife, that's what I'm doing is I'm creating comics. So, uh, so yeah, I, I guess the only hobby, the only new thing is, is, is poetry, which I would absolutely recommend uh to to anybody there's an excellent poet that i've paid a lot of attention to lately called uh, his name's malcolm geit and uh if you're familiar with c.s lewis at all uh i've never met a modern c i've never seen a modern c.s lewis in the way that i've seen mal what in the works of malcolm geit the man's yeah the man's brilliant uh and he and he's alive he's he's an old you know old british um is you he know, older he, than George R. R. Martin, who's been trying to write the like sixth book in the series for like the last fifty years? Or I something? think I think he's either the same age as George R. R. Martin, or maybe a little older. Um, occurs. But yeah, he's he looks like Santa. He's got oh, a he does look like Santa. White, he's got a big old white bushy beard, uh, uh, a very you know proper fun British raspy really? accent, and uh, and and just and and gives <laughs> lectures on poetry and different things like that. He's he's a, he's a very fascinating man. Is, does he have a better beard than that one one person we know of named Carl Witzman? Um, it's about on par, actually. It? It's very, yeah, it's very similar. They're they're uh, it's a little more full, it's a little more haggard <laughs> looking than Carl's. But <laughs> you know, speaking of beards, I'm just curious: was there ever? Did you ever have a clean shaven face of yours, or are you going to keep this thing going to the end of your days? I never want to see my chin again. Really. Mm-hmm. You're gonna keep this whole this whole facial hair thing going for the next yeah. fifty years. I, I really, if I last that long. <laughs> oh, don't worry, you will. You yeah. will. The force um, is strong in your family, so we believe in you, man. You can do it. Yeah. No, I uh, I I have proudly and uh, and I love this. This is a part of my face now. Um, I uh, I you know I, I I don't despise my face at all. I know some people do. Some people some people despise. Well, some people despise my face, but some people despise theirs, and that's why they have a beard, right? You know, is they're like, oh, I don't I don't have like four chins, and I don't care about that stuff. It's just I've gotten so used to my beard, and um, I feel like now. It's like my dad. My dad has had a mustache since I was born. He shaved it once. We all shunned him oh. until he grew it back. And, uh, <laughs> no. no. And, yeah. And, uh, because, I don't know, this is, this is my face and I enjoy, I enjoy the beard. I, I, I've, I've fully embraced the beard, um, culture. Now, the lengths of the beard may change. They do often sometimes. I, I, but as of now, I'm on a kick. I'm actually going to be Hagrid for Halloween for the kiddos that trick or treat in our neighborhood. Oh, and uh, really? yeah, it's fun. This was actually Robin's idea. I'm going to be Hagrid. She's going to be the birthday cake um, that the he gives Harry cake? Potter. The, oh, the one in yeah. Uh, when am I <laughs> the one from of? the first the first movie? Oh, uh, when he gives when he gives. So she's going to be a birthday cake, and we are dressing our uh, cats up as dragons. So dragons, uh, yes. And uh, we're going to, you know, our, our neighborhood is, uh, uh, we were fortunate enough to move into a neighborhood that this is the spot at this area of our city where sure. people drive to our neighborhood. People go nuts in our oh, neighborhood. Really? They, they they put up crazy decorations, as do we, uh, for Halloween and Christmas. Oh, and um, yeah, we have a blast. Kids come from all over to, to trick or treat here. And, and uh, we, we do the whole driveway chili, you know thing where we're all hanging out and it's a lot of fun it's do you a lot do, of fun. do you do the events that are held every year the trunk or treats at their local like community centers or churches um we well we just you know here in the neighborhood we we just do the traditional trick-or-treat but you sure, know sure, we, no I've, I've, I've i've done the trunk or treat stuff before mm-hmm. um and it's, been, it's uh, yeah, fun isn't it it's a lot of fun i, I really enjoy it um it, it's good it's fun for the kids it's fun uh you know to really go all out you know, for, for the kiddos, because, because, uh, hey, they're our future, and we got to cultivate imaginations, right? So, there as, you go. As you're, speaking of the future, let's talk about that for a minute, because I'm just curious, how did you become a part of the crew known as Comic Book Spectrum that is a part of the Rising Tide Broadcast Network, which also, by the way, you have a new show that's coming to the Rising Tide Broadcast Network. Tell us about it. 
Right. So uh, to answer your first question, I, um, so, uh, you know, I was, I had been, I think I'd been on Clever Title Pending once or maybe twice. Um, and, and I had been interacting with Brian a lot on Nevermind the Furthermore, as we all do. <laughs> and, um, yeah, one too and, many comments, that's for sure. <laughs> and um, he started talking about doing a comic book show. Uh, I think it was last, uh, end of the summer last year, early fall. And he started kicking around the idea and uh, I had, you know, I, I messaged him and I said, Hey, if you ever do this, I would love to be a part of it. And uh, you know, he finally decided to pull the trigger. He got in touch with me and Eric and Clyde and, uh, and, you know, we started kicking around ideas and uh, realized that we had good chemistry together. Uh, and uh, we all equally loved comics very much. And, uh, and, and we were super nerds and, uh, and decided <laughs> to share that with other people. So, uh, that's, I mean, that's really how it worked is, you know, last year when the pandemic started and I was at home all the time, I stumbled upon, uh, never mind the furthermore oh. and, uh, just really quite by accident. And, uh, and I fell in love with the, the, the personality of Brian K. Morris, uh, and, and how he interact with other people in the comments section oh my and, and I just started jumping in a little bit at a time. And I really started feeling like I knew these people and, and, and eventually I did know these people. Uh, and, and I really, I found my tribe and, uh, and when you do that, when you find your tribe, um, there's really nothing quite like it. And so, yeah, it just, the stars kind of aligned and, and, you know, Brian wanted to do a show like that. And I so happened to, um, you know, I was already doing uh, the Dastardly Dingoes podcast uh, with my friend Jeremy at the time. And it was right around the time where Chad joined us. And um, I was free on the night that they wanted to do the show. And, uh, yeah, we just we, we pulled the trigger and, and jumped in. And, and we, I think we're on this next week will be issue 33 um, of the uh, we've been doing it for, for 33 weeks so far. So and it's, you haven't uh, killed each other yet. That's very impressive. Also, yet, went, I, w- I was 33 years old once. <laughs> so, well, like, yeah, a couple of years ago I was too. Yeah. Uh, but so, uh, so it, it all worked out, didn't it? Yeah, it did. And and it is surprising uh, to me that we we actually do. As a matter of fact, we've we've already discussed certain. We 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 talk all the time via Facebook Messenger. We we've been talking this morning as well. Uh, we share stuff with each other all the time. You know. It, anymore now the, the first people that i turn to if i have any cool comic book news is those guys um and uh, and the same goes for them we we are in constant communication all the time just like buddies uh so the, what you see on the show that camaraderie is very real um which is also a rare thing and i i, I cherish that the, it, they're a great group of guys good friends uh, the more we do this together, the more uh, our friendship grows, and, and I love it. And the same can be said for Dastardly Dingoes, uh, which is the new show. It starts next Tuesday. Um, it's going to be taking the slot of um, Clever Title Pending on Tuesday mm-hmm. nights. Um, and uh, our first guest will be Brian K. Morris. Uh, just to oh, kinda, really? You know, How ironic. Yeah, I know. Just to kind of buffer that transition period. And then the month of October will be uh, a crossover between the dingoes and comic book spectrum. Uh, we'll be interviewing Eric uh, Hawkins. And then the next week we'll be interviewing Clyde. And then the next week, all of us will be together on one screen and it will be wonderful. And the universe will explode with excitement. Um, I was going to say, I think it's going to be utter chaos if I had to describe it plainly, because I've seen the comments section light up during CBS, which stands for <laughs> comic book spectrum. If you're trying to keep up with the acronyms at home, it's a great show. I think Comic Book Spectrum is a great show. And not only that, my friend and I started watching that, you know, a few months ago when you guys were, you know, got your first few issues out. Because you have a lot of issues. A lot of issues in those nine years. Let me just point that out. Indeed. And I ask you guys questions. I try to drop some stuff in every week or every chance I can. And I got to say, you guys answer them very respectfully. And you go into detail. You don't sugarcoat it. And we appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad because we really... That was the big thing, uh, Brian and all of us. Uh, the goal that Brian had, the vision that Brian had, was to 
create a comic book show that wasn't negative all the time. Now, every now and then we give bad reviews. This past week, we, we gave a couple, <laughs> which is fun. We have fun with it, right? Like, we, we do that. We, you know, if we don't like the comic, we throw the comic. But that doesn't happen very often. We really <laughs> like... We really like to be as positive as possible because we love comics. We love the world of comics. We love the comic book industry. And there's way too many people out there that just they're they're just getting subscribers because they're they're everyone loves a negative Nancy. And we don't want to be that. We want to be the fun, the fun, funny, um, you know, mostly positive show about comics. I mean, you don't want to be unrealistic, but but uh but we all all four of us, you know really we love what we do uh, all of us are writers and artists and and, uh, and and we love what we do and we want to celebrate what we do and for people who you know there there have been people who uh, entered into the show that didn't know a whole lot about comics they don't they don't know you know the the world of comic books uh, as well as 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 us super nerds do or they've never picked up a comic book before in their life uh, but they do enjoy watching us in our shenanigans and we've had a couple people start reading comics. One person is absolutely, um, my goodness, Sarah, Sarah, I, I'm afraid may take out a second mortgage because I, of her pull box. And <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Sarah, Sarah shows up in the comments one night, this newcomer comes in and I'm thinking, first of all, I've never met anybody who has the first and last name that are spelled differently, but yet they're still the same words. Sarah, Sarah, yeah. how are you tonight? I'm like, what? What's going on? <laughs> But then she drops all these comments and she's dropping all these questions and then she starts collecting comics. And I'm like, where do you, first of all, where do you, how many comic book stores are in your neck of the woods? That's number one. Right, yeah. Number two, do you have enough space for all this stuff? Because I feel like you buy like 200 comics a week and pretty soon you're going <laughs> to, you were saying, Brian, she's going to have to take out a second and third mortgage. Yeah. Yeah. I know she's, uh, she's fairly new to collecting comics and she's jumped right into the deep end I'll uh, say. And, and she's leaned into, uh, you know, uh, Brian K. Morris and, and myself and we've, you know, a couple other people have really been just like, because we know her personality enough to know what books she would like. And, um, and, and that's another cool thing about the show. You know, you, you drop in the comment section enough, we get to know who you are a little bit and we can actually help you find comics that you might enjoy because we've interacted with you enough to know you a little bit. That helps too. And, be, and during the course of the pandemic, I discovered a comic book store that's not even in my own state. It's down in Southern Florida in Melbourne called Famous Faces and Funnies. And they have Facebook live sales every week. Yeah, a lot of, of comic you know, stores are doing you know, that. Selling off comics, pop, Funko Pops, toys, collectibles, all that kind of stuff. Because yeah. of them and their Facebook live sales, because as during the pandemic, you couldn't really have too many people in your store. Right. So they had to go to other means. And by the way, anyone, any other comic book store that does this, I respect that. You guys are Absolutely. doing your marketing. You're doing the push. You're doing what you have to do to sell. I get it. Yeah. But when you watch Famous Faces and Funnies, Brian, you don't want to leave. Like, seriously, they put yeah. out all this cool stuff. And I'm thinking, I want this. I want this. I want this. Oh, wait, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go broke. And it's less than an hour. Yep. What the frack is going on? But it's been fun because I bought a lot yeah. of trade paperbacks and comics I otherwise probably wouldn't have. Yeah. Yeah. And, so. and that's that's honestly when that's the difference between people who enjoy and have a passion for what they do. Um, they can suck you in like that. You know, I, and it's it's not even an intentional thing. Right. Like like so many like myself, I, I, I love comics. I have bought comics my whole life. I have never had, I right now have two pull boxes at two different comic stores in my city. Um, and it's because I want to support the different stores that are, that are in my city, but also because I'm introducing myself to more comics because of comic book spectrum. I tell the guys all the time, like, you're making me poor guys. Stop, stop, it's, you know, celebrating all these books so much. Cause I can't, I can't buy all of them. <laughs> G Willikers, whether it's them or the comic book stores I've been buying from Facebook live sales or my local comic book shops, I've been getting my niece and nephew into comics. Yeah. And yeah. they like it a lot. Oh, and I'm I... thinking, yes, that is what I want. I want the new generation to realize that, yes, you can read a book with words on a page because books are great no matter what. Yes, but absolutely. if you're reading comics, then you're really getting a jump start. And then your imagination is yeah. really going to start running wild. And my niece yeah. and my nephew, I went to their... I went to pay him a visit the other night and I gave him some comics. One of them was Star Wars High Republic. Another one was Legend of Korra, Avatar. Hello. Mm -hmm. My niece looked at me and she's like, yeah, I've been, wa yeah, I've been watching Avatar, the last airbender and Korra and all that stuff. And I'm thinking, so you want the Korra comic, right? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, and I said, you know, we were just spitballing a bunch of stuff. And I said, how are things going with you? How's school? Blah, blah, blah. And she, she says, oh, things are good. You know, my sports schedule is a little bit 
you know, messed up. But I said, well, what, what is it you like to do? Like when you're not at school and stuff, she's like, I love to read. I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I yeah. want. That's what I want to hear. I love to read because I love to read. I've, I've become more of a fan of reading in general in spite of the pandemic, more so oh, now than I yes. ever was when I was a kid. Because when you're a kid, you have to read those books for school. You don't want to do that. You want to read on your own time, on your own dime. Am I right, Brian? Absolutely. So, I mean, there for a little while, yeah. especially in, well, I actually say seminary really had the opposite effect for me in that. Seminary is really what got me started reading a lot of um, well, that's uh, fair. Everybody's story nonfiction. Is yeah. But you're right. For the most part, when I was in grade school, oh gosh, I hated reading. I hated reading so had, much because I had to. Yeah. You had to um, read them. You had to write the reports. You got to write the yeah. paper, turn it in and get a, and get a 500 points. And I'm thinking, no, nah, no thanks. But <laughs> now that I'm reading stuff nowadays, I love it. I love yeah. the pieces. And it's because of the community that, once again, take a shot, Brian. Because of Brian K. Morris and all the peeps that he knows, I'm <laughs> discovering the indie world of writing and publishing is a lot bigger than I originally thought. Mm -hmm. It's probably bigger than the Star Wars galaxy and the Star Trek universe combined. Because there's so many different creators out there that are trying to get their names out there, get their marketing out. And I'm thinking, I'd rather read this stuff than yeah. anything that's going on outside my front door. Like I'd rather support all the indie people online yeah. and do other stuff. And that's not a slight against anyone else. I'm just saying the indie world is vast. And once you get in, you can never get out. And it's, it's very true. We're right now, what the comic book industry is seeing is a, is a very, very realistic is it's a Renaissance hmm. of, um, and we're pulling away for the most part, even though Marvel and DC are doing big things in, in Hollywood, uh, when it comes to the comics, um, the real gold is in the indie scene, um, and and really mostly on Indiegogo and Kickstarter. That the crowdfunding indie scene is is where the best stuff is right now. And you know, unfortunately, you can get a little burned because sometimes you back something that either doesn't get you know it doesn't get funded or it gets funded and you never see it. That can happen, but for the most part, uh, you, you know you're you you find the good creators that are out there that really have amazing stories to tell that um, you wouldn't have found ten years ago, uh, because DC or Marvel or you know the big publishers, they, they they were overwhelmed, and now, you know there is there's so many voices in this world that have different perspectives, different opinions, and and they have all found a way to create stories specifically in comic books and and share their perspective and their worldview with other people in this creative way and it's really become a new uh kind of a new marketplace you know if you if you you know type setting where where you know I'll read your comic and you read mine and and we'll discuss you know we're we're, we're thinking through uh worldview we're thinking through um politics and culture and 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 religious things and all these things when we're reading each other's stuff and it's really helping everyone understand the other person a little bit better um and and the best part about it is at this point in the time anybody can do it um anyone can uh can get on social media you know anybody can make a comic web comics are huge right now and they're free you know if you if you have a a, uh, you know, a, a drawing tablet, you can create that, post it online and do it every, do it every day. If you want to do it every week, there are platforms just for free web comics. Webtoon is great. Uh, there's a few others out there, but th there are, there's so many, there's a vast, um, uh, there, are, there are so many tools out there that you can use um to to get your your story out there and and i'm loving it i haven't bought i i every now and then i'll buy a dc or marvel book uh but for the most part i i don't buy those anymore because i want to support people who are like me uh who are you know really a, a true independent creator um uh, who i can talk to and and you know it, there's an old saying and it's it's floated around here recently it's I would I would rather support my friends and people that I that I know on Facebook uh, that I interact with. I would rather put my money towards them than people that that don't even know I exist, uh, because the quality of the stories are just as good, if not better. From what I've seen lately, it's better <laughs> in the indie <laughs> scene than it is in the big two. 
Um, I mean, the the book that I threw the other night on Comic Book Spectrum, I, the story really wasn't that good. It was only 16 pages long, and it's by one of the biggest creators in comic book history. And uh, and I've read better things, much better uh, stories in in indie by indie creators. Um, so yeah, if you're out there and you're watching this and you want to start creating comics, um, there, there's a couple tools that, that I would say comics launch is an excellent podcast to, to help you understand the ins and outs of being an indie creator, but also it's focused more towards Kickstarter. Um, and, uh, that's honestly where we get most of our stuff and just, it's, it's a free podcast. Start listening to it, start taking notes. Uh, but but start creating. Just start doing it. Uh, start following people who are doing the same thing a little bit a, a ahead of you. And just go do it because right now is the best time to do it. Great. I uh, love the sales pitch. We're talking with Brian Robb and comic book writer and artist extraordinaire. If you have any questions or comments for him, leave them in the comments section. We would love to hear from you. But don't forget to share this video with 500, all 500 of your friends. They're going to like the way they look after watching this video. I guarantee it. So, Brian, speaking of crowdfunding, I want to take a step back from it because this campaign just fi finished up several months ago. But, I, but I'm just curious. The Nebulizer, tell us, <laughs> what is the story about? How did it all start? And what comes next for someone known as the Nebulizer? Yeah, well, um, I uh, for those who don't know, I have uh, severe asthma and uh, I've had it all my life. Uh, and it's very uh, it can be very limiting um, a lot of times. You know, there, there's there's. Uh, um, a lot of times I'm stuck in my house and, and can't go anywhere, can't do anything. Cause I, frankly, I can't breathe. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, last year during the pandemic, I, uh, before, right before the pandemic started, I, um, I was talking with a couple of the guys that I, I work with at my day job. Uh, we're all nerds we we all work in a tech support, you know, uh, dungeon. <laughs> and, um, and it's, it's a, I, I, we refer to it as a shredders workshop. Because it looks like uh, the the warehouse from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, oh, movie, geez. and uh, <laughs> the only thing that's missing is the is the uh, is, is, are the uh, the skateboard ramps, but oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, and you know we, I was talking to them and and they have a little game that they like to play, which now has crossed over to uh, comic book spectrum, is make Brian laugh till he has an asthma attack. And oh, if you geez. do that, you win the game. And I always lose the game. So um, <laughs> so somebody won the game that day. And uh, I was on my, my nebulizer, my breathing machine. And um, we were, you know, kind of just talking as I'm trying to calm down and stuff. And one of the guys said, we just need to get you just a nebulizer suit where you can just walk around and you just push a button if you start feeling any kind of, you know, issues. And I, I thought that was funny. And so I drew, you know, I just drew up a little picture of what that would look like and and i showed the guys and they were like actually that looks they're like that looks really cool and so i drew a more serious one and then they loved it they were like this is amazing oh my gosh and um and so i shared that on social media and it got i don't know how many hits um on both facebook and instagram that more than i had you know really ever seen at the time uh, for me, for any art that I had posted. And, I said, and and so many people were like, oh my gosh, when's this going to come out? And I was like, I, I don't even know what this is yet. You know, like, so, so I had to really, you know, find the story after I had drawn the character. And, um, and, and, and what I did was I really pulled from, uh, I wrote the story in, in the middle of the pandemic last year. Um, you know, in, in my, time of being you know on lockdown at home and uh and it was very therapeutic uh but the the premise of the story is it's it's a uh, it's a guy who has you know chronic asthma he he has the worst recorded case of asthma uh in ever in history and um and he cannot survive without either being in that suit or in a in a cryo chamber that's just pumping, uh, you know, medicine in, into uh, the chamber at all times. And he has an AI that, that helps monitor everything. His name's Albie. Uh, you know, it's from Albuterol one is actually his real name. And, um, and uh, they have a snarky fun, uh, kind of a father son type relationship. And uh, at one point there was a, there was a nuclear blast and we'll get into that in a later issue. Uh, but it, it, it changed everything on the microscopic level into a macro mutation. 
And so all the decimites, all the, the pollen, all the things that could kill Connor, who's the main character, um, are now these giant monsters that he can now kill back. And, uh, and the whole premise of the story is there are vials that, 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 uh, keep his suit running and they, they're filled with medication that he needs and he's running out. It lasts for three years and he's almost out of medication, almost out of vials. So he's trying to find the laboratory, uh, of the scientists that made them for him. And, uh, he, you know, in issue one, he's been searching all of these different labs to no avail. And, um, and he's on the search for them all the while destroying allergen mutants uh, of various kinds. In the first issue, you will meet uh, mite heads, as he calls them. Uh, they're just dust mite mutations. And um, rag dogs, which are essentially werewolf and ragweed <laughs> type uh, monsters. And um, <laughs> It's pollen season. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, all throughout the comic, there's pollen flying in the air and, 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 uh, and, uh, we'll, we'll eventually get into a little more scientific explanation of what happens when the, 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 the micro things turn macro mutate. And now what does, what do they produce? You know, is it something new? Is it a mutation of something old? What's happening in the air now? And, um, and so, yeah, it, we're having a lot of fun with it. it. It's a very, it's a lighthearted take on uh on a on a very serious topic because uh when i was a kid you know i mean you you have uh you know you, you have heroes that uh have you know especially in marvel you have heroes that are known for what they can't do um they, they have flaws and uh and I, that kind of inspired the idea of well, what if this character is a superhero type for asthmatics it's a character that they can relate to um and and uh and look up to and, uh, and, and they can, you know, they can have fun watching him destroy all the things that try to kill them uh, on a daily basis. And, uh, and that was the inspiration behind it. And it's very much a, uh, uh, inspired by Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, the look, the feel, the tone. Um, and it's also, you know, got a fun, like a kind of a, uh, mutant, mad max feel to it as well but not in an intense way the way that mad max actually is um but yeah it's 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 humorous it's a post-apocalyptic action comedy is what i tell everybody so it's a lot of fun and it was the first toy that we ever produced through o toys um and uh let's get that up a little closer here he's a little loose in there right now <laughs> but uh but yeah it's uh it's a lot of fun and I'm excited. It's a, it's a mini series. So it's going to be the first, um, you know, the first issue. I think I actually, I have it right here. Here's the first issue. Ooh, nice. Very nice. I believe someone posted a picture of it the other day with their cat, Keisha a cuff yeah, dropped an image yeah. of her having the first issue and her cat was kind of non on. I'm thinking, does the cat <laughs> read this too, Keisha? Yeah, probably I'm wondering. Mine does. <laughs> Oh, your cat reads your books? Wow. Uh, my cat will just stand over my shoulder and judge whatever I'm doing. So oh. uh, judge it harshly. Oh, um, <laughs> but no, we, we this is the first installment uh, of, uh, of four issues. Oh, and four. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. So we will be releasing. And that's the first arc. Eventually down the road, I have, uh, you know, I, I have ideas for, for furthering um, adventures. And yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's going to be a, a self-contained uh, mini series that eventually will be in graphic novel form. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a ton of fun uh, just dreaming this stuff up. It's a ton of fun writing the dialogue between Connor and Albie because they're just bickering all the time. And it, 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 is, it is as serious as my other series, Memoirs of an Angel, is. This is the exact opposite. This is all fun, all snarkiness. It, it's it'll it'll tug at your heartstrings a little bit sometimes, but for the most part, it's just very all age, kid friendly, uh, dual level writing. The way that that you know I describe Batman the animated series, I did that to the best of my ability to where all, all ages will enjoy it and have fun with it. Ah, all ages, great. So anyone can read it. My niece, my nephew, yes, their friends, yep. their neighbors, their neighbors' kids, they can all read it. Fantastic. So fast forwarding to the present, a quick yes or no question here for you, Brian. Do you like swords? I love swords. Well, speaking of swords, this one just started up. I believe it's called Memoirs of an Angel. The new Kickstarter just launched yesterday on October the 1st, 2021. For those 
for you who may be watching this at home and maybe unfamiliar with this, tell us, how did Memoirs of an Angel come about? What is it about? And what are your plans with it moving forward? Oh, goodness. Okay. So this series, who this series uh, was in the making about 15 years before I actually started creating it. Um, it, it, it was, it, believe it or not, the origin of this series goes back to when I walked out of the theater after I saw Blade 2. Um, and it was the original <laughs> version of what this comic was, was essentially a blade, but it was demons instead of vampires and everything else was the same. <laughs> it was a total ripoff that it's not what this became, but those were the origins of, of, uh, the ideas for just this, uh, you know, kind of this dual realm, uh, hopping back and forth between the spiritual and physical realm, uh, interacting with different characters that, uh, uh, that may or may not meet, but abs absolutely are uh, are in the same space together. They just don't know it or can't see each other. Um, and uh, and it also has a lot to do with my own personal faith. Um, I uh, like I said, I was in vocational ministry uh, for a little while, as well as going to seminary for it. And um, and a lot of the things I've learned about my own faith, about, you know, the questions that I've had. I love questions. I love, you know, if something doesn't make sense while I'm studying the Bible, I really need to find out what the heck is going on here. You know what I mean? Like I, it's and, and, and I think that's very important. No matter what faith you have, no matter what you believe, you need to know why you believe it. Um, and, and if you stumble across questions you don't know the answers to, you, you should you should look for them uh look for for some kind of answers and in that search uh for you know my answers to why i believe what i believe this is the product uh it, it came out of me uh, it came into me theology doctrine and 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 you know prayer and all of these things and it came out a comic book series uh that is a horror fantasy um because uh if you read the bible and if you study the Bible, you will definitely find that there are a lot of horrific things uh, that take place, and um, and it, it, it. I think I think Christianity specifically and horror have a, a, a beautiful relationship uh, when it comes to storytelling. I mean, you look at you know stories like The Exorcist, The Conjuring series. I mean, a lot of horror. Uh, it, it goes with any kind of uh, personal belief system. There's always evil when it comes with good. And, and my idea with Memoirs of an Angel was to create the most diabolical, sinister, gross, disgusting evil to, to, to then counter that with the, the, the best of good, um, which, you know, in this case, uh, you know, in my and in my personal faith is God and angels and and, you know, light bringers and. And um, and then, you know, you have humans who are kind of stuck in between where uh, the, the humanity is a little more gray. Um, you know, it's it's uh, uh, you know, you've got everybody's got a little brokenness in them. And so I really wanted to, to you know, I I really wanted to show that in the series as well. And so as I'm but as I'm wrestling through all of these different questions, wrestling through all these different, you know, why does you know, what why does the. Uh, the God of the old Testament looks so different from the God of the new Testament. And what, what in the world does that mean? And you know, what, what were, what were the authors of the actual uh, books of the Bible thinking and who are they writing to and why, and what were their types of literary genre? Uh, because all of those things matter. You can't just read an ancient text, no matter what it is with a Western modern worldview, uh, because you'll absolutely get it wrong every time. And unfortunately so many people do and have and will get things wrong when they study the Bible and try to regurgitate its beliefs because they're reading it from an American modern Western worldview. And you, that was not the form that it was written in. And so you have to learn those things before you can even understand what, what they're saying in, in the context. And then once you learn that, then you have to decide, okay, well, do I believe this or not? But the whole point, of memoirs of an angel is to wrestle with those things. It's to wrestle with belief. It's to wrestle with uh, the fact that there may not be just a physical realm. There may be something beyond this. And what does that realm look like? And how does it interact with ours? That's the point of memoirs of an angel. And that's the point of, uh, of what I'm trying to, to say uh, when I'm telling this, this story that is very much horror and it is very much high fantasy. I, I tell everybody it's like Lord of the Rings meets the exorcist. 
um, you know, the, the, the pitch, if you will, is it's a ragtag group of infinite and finite beings that race through time and space to rescue a broken and bitter witch hunter from the clutches of the dark kingdom. Uh, and, uh, and it is very much Lord of the Rings meets the exorcist, you know, in the, in the heightened scene of, uh, you know, in the exorcist, if you've seen it, where she's levitating on the bed and they're mm-hmm. saying the power of Christ compels you yeah. and all that. If you pull back the curtain to the spiritual realm, that's memoirs of an angel. Um, so we, we've done seven issues so far and, um, we are now on the eighth issue, which is the beginning of the end of volume two. Um, so we'll have eight, nine, and 10 volume two will wrap up the end of next year, uh, with the 10th issue of the series. And, uh, and then we'll do the trade paperback and then move on. Um, so the, uh, just to kind of answer the, the end of your question, uh, the, the future of memoirs of an angel uh, it's going to probably end up capping out at about 50 issues. I do have an Jeez. ending. It's an epic tale. Uh, but how we're breaking it up, because that's a big, yeah. that's a heavy, 50 heavy thing. Is, 50 is a big number. It is. It's a big it's number, and it's hard to number. ingest, you know, a slow, that you know, that all at once. So, so what I'm doing is every three volumes of the series is one book. Hmm. So there will be four books total. Okay. Uh, the book we're working on right now is called The Grey Pilgrim, and it's mm-hmm. all about Jonathan Young, who is the central character. He's the broken and bitter witch hunter that uh, everyone is focusing on. And the story really kind of, we, we, we get to know all the characters for sure, but it really always comes back to him, who he is, and why he's important. And, um, and that's what this book is about. So in every way, very much a take on Gandalf. The, the nickname for Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings, which he is the gray pilgrim, uh, which literally he is a pilgrim running through like a wasteland called the gray. So there you go. Ah, um, makes, uh, makes sense. Cause I'm taking a look at this and I'm thinking, I have no memory of this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I had to bring in some Lord of the Rings. Love oh, you, you have man. to, you have to absolutely. And, the fellowship um, of the ring is my favorite of the, of the trilogy. I love that movie. I, I actually, I argue that that is the best one. Uh, because it, without the Fellowship of the Ring, you won't care about the other two. Mm-hmm. It does. And you all don't the get work. you don't get what's going on. And you don't get the environment. The the movie that no. sets everything up and introduces you to this universe and this world and how it works. I mean, who have thought that we would get into a place of Middle Earth stands upon the brink of destruction? Like I'm thinking, wow, that is a big speech, yeah. but it but it but it hooks you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and the beginning of the movie, especially the books, oh, the, 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 pro, the books are the excellent. Epilogue, but, the, prologue is that what yeah. it's called at the beginning uh, of something prologue. yeah it's the so whole flashback good. yeah yeah so that so good uh with uh uh kate blanchett's amazing you know vocals behind it just oh yeah you know very Galadriel? whispering the, that yeah galadriel See, yeah i remember is, a few things from lord yeah Rams. look there at you, you proud but uh but no it, it's uh yeah it's a great great series but so right now we're focusing on you know buttoning up um uh the the first book uh, sure. We're ending volume two, volume three will be the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, that, that will be a self for the most part, a very self-contained story from issue from issues one or zero, technically, if you count the prologue uh, from issue zero to issue uh, 13 or 14 is, is going to be the first book. Um, and that will be for the most part, a self-contained story that absolutely focuses on what's coming when it ends. But uh the, the things that begin in issue one will be buttoned up for the most part in issue 13. Lucky 13 or unlucky. We don't know. We'll that's, see. It's a good stay, question. stay tuned. <laughs> I was going to say that that's a, that's a, that's a very, that's a very good. Wow. 50. I knew this memoirs of an angel was going to keep going for a little bit, but I didn't think 50 is a, listen, yeah. that's like going through the tallest mountain of Mount Everest or going through the mines of Moria. I mean, yes. that's, it's a tall order, man. But if anyone can do it, we know that the Rod Man can do it because he's the cream that rises to the top. Yeah. So <laughs> we believe in you, man. You can do it. I mean, 50 Thank is a you. Thank giant, you. giant number. But hey, yep. as long as you found your tribe a few years ago with BKM, Brian K. Morris, for those of us here on Keep Up With The Acronyms at Home, and his his crew of wonderful people, if anyone can do it, you can do it, Brian. Keep on I, doing I, it, man. Yeah, I'm, I've always said, even if, uh, you know, even if it doesn't work out, with uh with kickstarter and you know everyone stops buying these books and this goes back to what i said earlier i will still make this series uh oh, e- even even if it is just for me um mm. because um 
you know, even if it becomes a web comic, uh, uh, you know, the, I, I, I'm still going to, I'm still going to create it because this story in particular means so much to me personally mm-hmm. that, um, I mean, I, you know, I told you, I, I, I wrote notes about this thing 15 years before it was actually even a comic. Uh, half the time I didn't even think it would actually ever see the light of day. So it was literally just, it's, it's a way of, it's honestly, it's a way of me interacting with my faith and with God, uh, in a way that, that complements my personality. Uh, I love comics. I love horror and I love fantasy. So it it just kind of naturally flows out of me and, uh, and I, I I love it and I'm going to be doing it no matter what. Well, as one person once said, if you love what you do, it's never called work. It's very true. It's very, very true. Keep on, keep on pressing on. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions for Brian Robin, leave them in the comments, leave them in the chat. We'll take them uh, as we go along here. But Brian, the next set of questions are going to be brought to you. Every This episode of And I Quote and every episode of And I Quote, I should say, is powered by Poddex. Poddex are the hottest new tool for podcasters looking to have more meaningful conversations or gamify their podcasts. You simply shuffle up the cards. You ask a question and just let the content roll. Get yours today. Go to poddex.com. Make sure to use promo code NERDCULTURE to get 10% off your order. You're not going to want to miss it. You're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. So I can't help it, Brian. I've watched too much TV. This is what happens when you've watched too much TV in the three decades that you and I have been on God's green earth. You tend to oh, remember I, certain jingles and certain commercials just stick out in your head. I absolutely so, understand. I use half my language is just movie quotes, so I get it. Which reminds me, you and I got to get that T-shirt that says, I speak in fluent movie quotes, or I speak movie quotes. You know what I mean? <laughs> absolutely. There, isn't there a shirt out there that says, my primary language is movie quotes somewhere? I believe I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen that somewhere. Yeah, you and I got to pay a visit to Tea Public and get ourselves some new threads, you know, because it is the fall season. Temperatures are it changing. Is. The leaves yeah. are changing. Yeah. Other things I are stare, happening. I stare outside my window right now and I look at the uh, the trees. They're yeah. now starting to slightly turn orange and that makes me happy. See what I mean? Yeah. Well, your, fir- your first thing up for grabs here, Brian, what's the first impression you want to give people? Um, when it comes to the comics? No, just the first. You're, oh, you're, just in general. Yeah, in okay. general. Yeah. Um, That's where I'm going. I would say comfort. Um, just, you know, if you interact with me, the first thing I want you to feel is you can be yourself. Be comfortable. You don't have to worry about judgment. You don't have to worry about living up to a standard. Just be you and, and, and we'll have some fun and we'll have a conversation. And it'll be, you know, it'll be grand. No matter, no matter who you are or what you think you know, we can find something to talk about and laugh about. And, and that, that's, that's the, that's what I'd love for people to feel when they interact with me. Hmm. Respect. There you go. Yeah. So name some, name something, excuse me, on your to-do list that never gets done. <laughs> Dishes. <laughs> It's the it's it's my never ending nemesis. Um, <laughs> my gosh, if there was mm. ever an enemy of my life, it's dishes. Um, mm. It's uh, it, it never stops. You'd think I'd just get smart and just use uh, paper and plastic and just do recycle. But uh, here <laughs> I am. Save Mother a, Earth. Why don't you? <laughs> exactly. But um, but no, I, I I I still use dishes and wash and you know wash them when I can. <laughs> so <laughs> so there we are. When you can, so more often than not, is it the missus that's cl- that's washing the dishes, or is it different? Um, it, well, she we kind of flip back and forth sometimes. We both equally hate laundry and dishes, oh. so one of us will do one, the other one will do the other. Uh, that's go. usually how it works. It's an even trade, so to speak. Indeed. There you go. So, what does your typical Friday night look like? Uh, I'm at the drawing table um every friday night uh, i i may have a movie going uh, i may uh, depending on what time of year it is actually uh starting usually around this time i will a lot of times if i'm not at the drawing table you will find me in uh on my back patio at my fire pit uh with a nice glass of uh um of bourbon usually um uh, and sometimes the wife will join me and we'll just kind of sit there and you know get lost in the fire and conversation or read or whatever Mm, sounds relaxing i would say yeah that's yeah that's one way to look at it do you have an area of your life that you are never satisfied with oh probably my physical uh exercise (laughs) 
that because I have asthma so badly, so I can't really go out and be as fit as I would like to. Um, so that would probably be the, the, the part of my life that I am never satisfied with is, is just, um, uh, you know, the, the, the physical health part. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, I mean, uh, you know, that sounds like a, well, that's a damper, but you know, it, it has its positives as well, because like I've always said, the way I look at it is I've always struggled with asthma. I've always struggled with my health, but because of that, it led me to comics because when I was a kid and I had, you know, I couldn't go outside and play with my friends. I couldn't do these things. I was stuck inside on my breathing machine. My parents would sit me down in front of movies, cartoons, and put comics in front of me with a drawing pad. And that's where it all started. Um, and, uh, and, and so because of my asthma, because of my lack of being able to go out and do a lot of things physically, uh, I was able to start doing this. And in, you know, look, here we are. <laughs> so it's kind of like a warped version of Mr. Glass in Unbreakable. He, he had bit. trouble with his health issues growing up, so his mother would give him a comic book, and that's how Mr. Glass became Mr. Glass. Yeah, and absolutely. by the way... Except I didn't become a supervillain. Yeah. No, well, no, no, <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. You, you were on the flip yeah. side of things. You became a good guy. You became a protagonist, not an antagonist. But at the same time, I finally saw Unbreakable for the very first time earlier this oh, year. Oh, really? And I, and I got to say... What a heck of a psychological take on yes. comic books and what heroes and villains mean to the world. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I that love that story movie. between Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson. That's my. I'm like, this is a. I mean, yes, it's a movie, but it's more of a psychological thriller. Yeah. Than anything for else, because sure. you are constantly, you know, he's like, this is how life is. This is how life's. And then David, you have powers. You need to start using them. And Bruce Willis is like, no, 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 no. I don't want to. No, no, no. It's about someone coming into the light and realizing yeah. that they are here and they should use their powers. But at the same time, every light needs to have darkness. And that's where Mr. Glass fits in. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so that was a heck of a start to the trilogy. And then when I saw Split and everyone loses their minds at the end credit scene where you see Bruce, I'm like, why is everyone yeah. losing it? I don't get it. I don't oh, get it. that's and then they, true. Oh, and then no, they looked at me and they're like, that. dude, you haven't seen Unbreakable? I'm like, no. Yeah. I'm like, dude, oh, if man. you had seen Unbreakable, you would understand why people were losing their minds in the theater when Split came which by the way that's just a great way to see a movie title split you know and james yeah. mcavoy a guy can play a good guy professor xavier in three movies four five well we don't count the one two i like <laughs> apocalypse but then dark phoenix came out and that oh. really put a sour taste in my mouth yeah, but don't get me bad. wrong mcavoy you killed it in the first one days mm -hmm. of future past is my all-time favorite x-men movie so i gotta give yep, you credit where credit it. is due on that one jack yep. and then apocalypse i don't think it's as bad as some people make it out to be it's fine no, it's I, okay. I think it's fine it's good yeah. it's not great but it's fine but for him to play Xavier in one movie and then play someone with split personalities in another, that's, you want to talk oh, about range as an actor? Yeah. James McAvoy turns it up to 11. Well, if you really, and I would even say, I would counter that with, uh, uh, to agree with you, but I would say, instead of using Professor X, I would say using um, Mr. Tumnus. Oh from, yes, Chronicles of Narnia, the Chronicles line of, of Narnia. Order, which is one of my favorite yeah. fantasy adventure films. Yeah, I, I mean, you look at you look at his character in that movie compared to Split. Well done, sir. He's, it's like it's it's almost like night and day. Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, it's a crime that he didn't get any kind of Oscar uh, nomination or or, or win. For yeah, or even even some split. Oscar buzz for some of the roles that he's played. I mean, maybe Absolutely. not so much Mr. Tumnus because that was more of a small right, supporting yeah. role. But Xavier, Days of Future Past especially was a tour de force of acting. Yeah, yeah. For both I mean, him and Patrick, like all the you know the the older iterations and the younger iterations of those characters. Oh I yeah, everyone in that film an honorary Oscar for best ensemble cast because Days of Future Past is freaking awesome. It is amazing, and I would even say Logan. I would add Logan to that list as well. Yeah. Uh, the fact yeah. that, that when I stopped really caring about the Academy Awards was when um, movies like Hereditary and Split and Logan even um, didn't get any kind of uh, acknowledgement. The <laughs> yeah, the well, the Dark Knight especially. But, I mean, we did get a, a the posthumous, posthumous for Heath Ledger. Yeah, 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 we did get that, so that's something. But... But the fact that they completely disregard these movies that just don't live up to the standards of Academ of the Academy Awards, screw them. They don't know what's good anymore. It's, it's always the same type of film that they pay attention to. And they don't pay attention to any of the other films that are just as good or better. Uh, but because they land in a specific genre, they won't touch them. And um, 
and 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 once that once i i you know fully realized that i was like all right i'm done i don't care anymore because these movies are, are are things i just i don't really care for yeah someone so we did a show earlier this week it was called fantasy film fights where we gather a panel of together and we draft films that the, that this week's topic just to give a quick plug to feature presentation trivia league look it up on youtube tony and his crew are a great bunch of people we were talking about rotten tomato movies that have a score of 76 to 100 percent critic rating not audience rating right critic rating. right and amaru drafted x2 x-men united because in his mind that's his favorite x-men film. now i'm not dogging him for that because x2 is mm-hmm. a great film but I and I said this during the panel. I said, "Listen, Rue, I'm not faulting you for this because X2 is one of the better X-Men films that's ever been made. Period. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look at look at Alan Cumming as Nightcrawler. Oh, but brilliant performance. So only, so good. Not only was he good in that movie, but like that's a good movie. But I said to Amr, I said, "Look, it may not be my personal favorite X-Men movie because I put Days of Future Past above that. But yeah. that's not a slight in any way, shape, or form against X2, X-Men United. So we were." We were talking about that on the show. If you haven't seen that, it was a great panel. I think I drafted some good movies. I think you might want to. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. You have to look at my list, man. Listen, I went off the reservation. I didn't do any of my typical Ryan picks, which would have been like two comic book movies, three Bond movies, or like, you know, whatever. Because I grew up on all of us here. And maybe you watching this at home, maybe grew up on a number of these franchises. But I tried to go off book. It's I want to be unconventional. I want to break the mold. I don't want to say, oh, well, of course, Ryan would pick this. No, 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 no. I wanted to go against the grain, Brian. (laughs) <laughs> Always go against the grain because you want to pull the rug right underneath the people. You want to make them think twice before they think, oh, he's just going to pick the same five. I yeah. was tempted, though. I was tempted to pick a few usual Ryan picks, but yeah. I went against it. So with that, <laughs> gee, Willikers, with that being said, if you had to lose one of your five senses, Brian, which one would you give up? Um, Probably, mm, man, that's difficult. Yeah, it's, it's one of the five. Oh, probably mm. taste, oh. which is surprising. But the reason is because then I would be able to eat healthy and not suffer. <laughs> uh, but I, I, you know, I don't know. I would, uh, I'd say that's probably at the top of the list. I don't want to lose any of them, but if I had to lose any of them, I would probably say either, either smell or taste. Uh, they're, they're so tightly knit together that I, I, one or the other, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is wow what a what a way to go out on that section yeah. of questions which by the way they are powered by poddex make sure you go to poddex.com use promo code nerdculture to get 10 percent off your order i don't know about you but these are some cool cards with cool questions and i hope my future guests on and i quote are going to appreciate appreciate them as much as you watching this at home or maybe even you brian appreciate the questions i'm trying my best here throw me a freaking boom here I'm the boss. Need the info. Okay, no problem. So, <laughs> with that being said, oh, wow. Some, let's see here. Oh, uh, let's see. Someone chimed in here through Twitch. They say, Houston, we have a, wow, I don't, I don't want to read that. But what about, sen- what about sense and then you won't feel pain? I'm not sure where you're going with that, buddy, but I don't know. Maybe, oh, you mean like the sense where you can't feel pain? So, it's like one of the things in your medulla oblongata or something because there was a villain in james bond and the world is not enough where there was a bullet coursing through his yeah. head to the point where he couldn't feel pain that was renard played by robert carlisle in 1999 if that's what you're trying to get at us here houston we have a blank Let that would know. work I'm, that would work if that's what he's talking about that that would be fine i would be okay with not feeling pain not feeling pain i mean i guess yeah. i mean if you don't feel pain does that mean you don't have to use your nebulizer suit or your well, no i still that then actually well see because it's not pain it's more just like a <gasps> <laughs> so yeah. the air just stops so it's not really a painful experience it's just a you know a panic um boy gee whiz boy that's okay i was gonna see i don't know much about biology i didn't do so well when i was in high school when it comes to certain science and math classes they really weren't my forte let's just put it to you that way that's ah, okay i suck at math <laughs> see that's why we need to consult your local calculator or your local smartphone if you if you need an answer to a mathematical Indeed. question just saying so Brian, Halloween's coming up. You've already described who you're going to be for Halloween, which in your case is going to be Hagrid. Am I right? Mm-hmm. That's from the yep. Harry Potter yep. series, played by the great Robbie Coltrane, if I remember correctly. Yep. Who also played Valentin Dimitrovich Tchaikovsky? Yeah. You know him? Yeah, I gave him a limp. Uh, speaking <laughs> of James Bond, and hey, No Time to Die comes out next week. Yeah, very excited so find, about it's that. It's the swan song for Mr. Daniel Craig. Are you excited? Uh, yeah, I am. I think it'll be really good. Uh, my favorite. It looks good. 
Daniel Craig, uh, I'm torn between him and Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan, yeah. just because he was my Bond. We, and I, yeah, you and yeah. I grew up in the same time period. So Goldeneye was my first Bond film. And that was one Me of the too. first. Yeah. first but that was my first Bond film I ever th- saw in theaters with my late father, bless this man's heart. Mm. He introduced me to James Bond because he, you know, because he, you know, grew up watching the Sean Connery films. Yeah, His favorite yeah. one is Goldfinger, believe it or not. Huh. So we went to see the movie. And as soon as the movie was over, my jaw was on the floor. And I said to my dad, I like this. I want more of this. I want to have one. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait for the next one, dad. Those yeah, no, movies. I my favorite um my favorite James Bond movie up until just a few years ago was Goldeneye. Um but then it became Skyfall. Um, Ooh, did Adele kill it with that theme song or what? Man, man? she absolutely did, but she won it, the Oscar was, for it. Yeah, and she should have. It was uh, but the movie itself was just fantastic. I uh I I love what they did um with the character and I feel like I feel like they've finally treated James Bond uh, they, they've pulled him out of the cliche that he kind of fell into as a mm-hmm. character and really gave him personality with the Daniel Craig series. So uh, I'm very excited to see how they wrap it up. And uh, and I'm excited to see uh, where it goes from there. Uh, who, who knows what kind of bond we're going to get next. So that's, that's the big question. As soon as No yeah. Time to Die is over, everyone's going to be asking the immortal question, who's next? Yep. Who's the next James Bond? In my opinion, it should be Henry Cavill. But I think that would be a great choice. I, I, mean, I think between him or Idris Elba, Idris yeah. Elba is just a little old. Yeah, those um, are the two names yeah. that have been floating around for years and years. People are saying because Henry Cavill was this close to actually being James Bond in Casino Royale, and then Daniel Craig yeah. got it from him. Yeah. So Henry, buddy, pal, this series of being James Bond, that is this is your white knight. Yeah. So do it, Henry. Do it because I don't know if they're going to make a Man of Steel two anytime soon. Which, by the way, I hate you. I, by the way, I hate you executives for doing that. Yep. But Henry, if you don't become Superman at least one or two more times in an actual Superman trilogy, not something that's like connected to other films, hmm. like your own solo films, you see what I'm saying? Like if they don't give me my Man of Steel trilogy that we so rightfully deserve, give him James Bond because he killed it in the Man from Uncle that came out just a few years ago. Yeah, years earlier. yeah, that was kind of a, a James Bond. That was his audition. Yeah, so I think he would be an excellent James Bond. Absolutely. So, Henry, I know you watch this program. <laughs> we would love for you to be the next James Bond. Executives at Eon Productions, Barbara Broccoli, Michael G. Wilson, I know you're watching this. Do yourself a favor. Sign him to a deal. Because there I can you guarantee you, Henry is going to put butts in the seats. He's going to sell tickets. And I think he could be a really good James Bond. Not Maybe even not just good. I think he could be great. Yeah, he could in be really opinion. good. The guy's yeah. a beast. And he's a hardcore nerd. He assembled a computer from scratch. Yeah, and he plays uh, tabletop all the time. Does he? Doesn't he also play yeah. like Warcraft and yep. other stuff like that? He's a huge nerd. I was going to say, he is a huge nerd like ourselves, Brian. Indeed. So we'll just leave it at that. But we want to take this opportunity to, to thank Brian Robin for being our guest this week on And I Quote. Brian, where can everyone find you online and everything you have coming up? Uh, well, right now we are running the, uh, Kickstarter campaign. We launched yesterday. We are more than halfway, uh, there. And, um, uh, yeah, it's for issue eight of Memoirs of an Angel. You can go to this link right here and, uh, and you can go and check out all the reward tiers we have. We have this time I showed the toy for the nebulizer. So here is the toy that we are offering for this campaign. It's Moriel one of the main angelic characters and uh it's done by o toys every toy will be signed by me and it'll be numbered there's a limited limited option of these of 10 uh and we've already sold a few of them so uh that is one of the top tiers there is a catch-up tier as well both digital and physical um and uh and there's a lot of options for you out there there's a lot of add-ons you can get one of these guys if you want to as well um and then there's of course a mother load um reward tier where you will get everything that we have um so yeah i head to head to this uh head to this link right here and um this guy and uh yeah enjoy yourself please back it and uh let me know when you do. Give me a shout out on Facebook. And uh, other than that, you can find me on brianrobin.com. You can also find me at uh, YouTube uh, on the Dastardly Dingoes podcast, as well as uh, um, Comic Book Spectrum. Both are on the Rising Tide Network uh, now. So, uh, And also check out all the Rising Tide Network shows. Uh, They're fantastic. 
a group of people who are not just broadcasters, but are also creators. They talk about creating. They talk about um, just life as a creator. They talk about uh, just books and different things that they love doing. Uh, we've got shows about uh, conspiracy theories. We've got shows about watches. We've got shows about cigars. We've got shows about books and movies. Uh, anything you would want, you can find it there at the Rising Tide Broadcast Network. So thank you so much for having me, man. This has been this has been great. I've really enjoyed myself. And I'm not sure, but you may or may not have broken the record for the longest episode of And I Quote up to this point. I think well, I talk a lot. <laughs> yeah. no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just saying, I think records may or may not have been broken. We'll have to go back into our catalog and make sure that our numbers are correct. But we can talk to you more about more about that a little bit later on. And speaking of shows on the Rising Tide Broadcast Network, there's even one that talks about mixing and putting together drinks Indeed. with the Davies family. And by the way, Ted, if I ever see you in person and you're going to make me, or you know, whether yourself or we're at a place where they're, they're serving drinks and someone else is making them, don't get me wrong. Ted, if I see you, I'm going to walk up to the bartender and I'm just going to simply look him dead in the eye and say, fuck a martini. Shaken, not stood. Because I grew up on James Bond. I got to taste one at least once. I got to taste it and see what it's like. I, I'm just yeah. I'm just going to throw that out there. That's on my bucket list, Ted Davies. Unfortunately, gonna... it's gross. And Well, let me... <laughs> I, hey, look, if it is, it is. But I want to take at least a sip to see what it tastes like. You know, let me... Let me do something okay let, yeah, me, let me try something go for it. there's nothing wrong with trying something new in your life just try to keep that in mind as we go along i want to once again thank you brian for being here my name is ryan of neuroculture you can follow us on all forms of social media simply at its neuroculture new videos are being posted on our youtube channel each and every week so make sure you're like commenting sharing these videos subscribing we do this content we put together this content for you to make sure that we cater to your nerdy heart's desire and also, you can check out, check out, and I quote, every Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern time right here on Nerd Culture's Facebook page. And also check out my podcast. It's called The Nerdcast, where I talk about some of the latest movies I've had a chance to see. So feel free to check that out. It's on Google, Apple, Spotify, or Stitcher, wherever you download your podcasts. You can find it there. In the meantime, to you, stay healthy, stay strong, stay safe, read books, read comic books. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I'm G.W. Pomager. I'm Dina Marie. I'm Sage Ia. Hey, I'm Thomas Carter Rochester. Hey, I'm David Thompson. Hi, I'm Kevin. And I'm Mia. Hi, I'm Mark. Hey there, this is Dave Adams. Hi, I'm Rosemary Rose. Jerome Connor here. Hey guys, it's Josh Bauer. It's Willow Schuyler. I'm Cosplay Michael. Hey, I'm Bob. It's your boy Country. Hey, I'm Ryan Permison. And I'd like to ask you guys, please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please, please, please subscribe. 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 Please subscribe to HWWS Web TV. Great bunch of people. And don't forget to smash the bell. Ring that bell. Smash that bell. Hit that bell. Hit the bell to be notified. Hit the bell to get notified of new shows and videos. You're going to want to do that, so do that soon. So we can cross that 20,000 mark. And get us to 100,000 subscribers. To a million and 10 million and 100 million. On HWWS. Web TV. You really like it. I guarantee it.